It was brought to my attention about an hour ago, about an hour and a half ago, actually. The law that was passed in December of last year in New York regarding transgender people. Now, there are two parts to the law. One of them I highly disagree with and one of them I highly agree with. The part I disagree with is fining employers for intentionally misgendering someone. And my reason for being against that is how are, how are they going to actually prove whether it was intentional or not? And some people just get really offended and don't care if someone apologizes. So you know, that could get really messy. I don't agree with that part of it. And if an employer does this, they can be fined $125,000. If they do that and they try to enforce a dress code, this is the, this is the other part of the law, they try to enforce a gendered dress code that they could be fined an additional $125,000. Now, I don't think an employer should be able to have a gendered dress code. If the, the women are allowed to wear something, then so should the men. If the men are allowed to wear something, then so should the women. That's how I feel about it. But this additional thing of if someone misgenders someone... I, sorry, but that's that's fucked up. That's a fucked up law. And that, to some degree, is the social justice warrior mindset making its way into law. On a side note, I, I'm, I've been thinking about, well, what will Obama do in the last period of his presidency if it's found out that Trump will be president? Will he shove forth a bunch of things in, the, in those last couple months? And when I say things, I'm meaning things that the SJW crowd and the EMS crowd and uh, some of the more extreme ends of BLM crowd would be overjoyed with. Anyway, Something else I was thinking about is how, like, for myself, and I don't know if other people experience this or not, but whenever there's something that's really good that happens to me, unless it causes a domino of other good things happening to me, I'm always, you know, expecting, well, what, what happens when the other shoe drops kind of thing. And if something happens really, really soon after something really good happens to me, if something bad happens, or something unfortunate, something that makes what I thought was good not look as good, not look as much of an, of an accomplishment, not look as, you know, that sort of thing, then I get really pissy for, for a while. I mean, really pissy. Uh, mood swings. And... I kind of wonder whether that's what's occurring right now with the SJWs and the uh, essentialist, multiculturalist socialists. Um, and let me be clear, I would put myself somewhere in the democratic socialist category. I'm kind of in the center of the left bottom quadrant of the political compass somewhere around there. But but I wonder if some of the ways the SJWs and uh, the EMSs out there are acting is because we just had gay marriage legalized. And they were sort of expecting it to be this domino effect of more liberal things going through, and it's not. And then there's all the discussion that's happened that, you know, since then that's made the gay marriage thing not look quite as much of an accomplishment as it was first looked at. And so I kind of wonder if there's this, you know, that same kind of reaction with a group of people as what happens with individuals, or at least I know what happens with myself. I can't really speak for other people. I don't know if other people experience that sort of thing. I mean, in some ways, it's very Charlie Brown, you know? You know, where he's talking about how he always expects something bad to happen. 
way earlier today, I watched The Triggering. Has political correctness gone too far? That whole conference that took place at, oh, I can't remember what university it was, but uh, Christina Hoff Summers really articulated her points well. Um, she really, she's blunt and yet detailed, and she doesn't tend to leave a bunch of insults along the way. Um, I can't stand Steven Crowder. Can't stand the guy. He's, I'm sorry, I, I view him as a bigoted asshole. It doesn't matter to me whether he, he makes some good points in some of the things that he says. There's always some sort of insult towards individuals or towards a group of people. He's just an asshole. And then there's Milo Yiannopoulos, the self-hating gay guy, uh, Catholic. Um, yeah, I don't really care for his stuff either, but what Christina Hoff Summers said was really reasonable, and so I want to leave clips of some of what I thought the best things she said from that conference. The, the correct word, the correct word for contemporary third wave campus feminism is not cancer, but madness, utter madness. Future hist no, listen, this is very important. Future historians are going to look back at what? Please. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Craig. Please, please. Uh. Future generations will look back. Shh, okay. I'm sorry. Three one, strikes, one more you're out, darling. One more disruption and we'd have to ask you to leave the venue. Thank you. Please, please keep your, please keep your comments, please keep your comments to the Q&A section. Thank you. What I think is kind of ironic about that feminist yelling, but what about my free speech, is if this was a conference that had a bunch of feminists on the panel, they wouldn't even let people ask questions if they were the wrong types of questions. If it was anything that even slightly questioned anything about feminism in a negative way, they would not give the person a platform. And at a lot of these places, they're considering them safe spaces. So it's just absolute hypocrisy on behalf of some of these feminists that are acting like little fucking children. Privileged children with rich parents. I invited her here as a demonstration of utter madness. Thank you. It's going to be impossible for future historians to understand what happened on the American campus this decade. It's, I mean, we have campuses across the country. You have armies. <laughs> Uh, stop acting like a child, and I will. <laughs> On campuses across the country, speech, ideas, sexuality, humor, it's being, you know, it, it, there's censorship, freedom of expression is being replaced by the right to feel comfortable. There's an absurd and manipulative vocabulary that has materialized, trigger warnings, safe spaces, microaggressions. Now, I first encountered I first encountered this madness last year when I visited Oberlin and Georgetown University. Now, I'm a philosophy professor. I've been in universities most of my life, and uh, I never encountered what I'm seeing here tonight, but mo it was much worse at Oberlin. You're, you're doing well compared to Oberlin <laughs> and Georgetown. Uh, and as a philosophy professor, partial to logic and rules of evidence, um, I was disturbed at just this... Or <laughs> at both schools, at both schools, and students organized a safe space where they could flee if someone was panicked by my words. And during my talk, 30 women and a therapy dog fled to a safe space. <laughs> I triggered a dog. <laughs> I feel bad about that. Now, <laughs> at... You're triggering another dog! In 2015,
Queen, there was a, a, a conference in London of feminist leaders from all over uh, the, the Great Britain, and the, the participants were advised not to clap. They were told that clapping could be triggering, trigger anxiety or pain in speakers. Instead, the, the, the conference attendees were told to use something called feminist jazz hands. Uh, what is not cool are efforts to censor, to silence. And, and, and what really amazes me is that in their war against intolerance, these campus activists, they, they've taken on the, the, the extremes of intolerance. They demonize, they otherize, they attempt to censor. I, I demonstrate it here. And they're not even nice. They're not, e they're not even nice to each other. And they do. What you're doing is hateful. What you're doing right, it's not civil. Now, where did it all come from? What created some of the forces you see in this room? What created it? How did it happen? It all goes back, I will tell you, at least the feminist dimension goes back to the early 1990s when the seeds of today's intolerant, censoring, victim-focused activism, when they were planted. It was 1992, and I attended the annual meetings of the National Women's Studies Association in Austin, Texas. And I was there, not, not so much to participate, but to observe. I was writing an article. I was working on my book, Who Stole Feminism? And I was persuaded that this conference would provide some interesting material. Now, the conference organizers had imbibed the lessons of a theory of feminism known as intersectionality. So on the first day, participants were instructed to break down into little groups based on their grievances and healing needs. So there was a group for Asian American women, African American women, old women, Jewish women, disabled women, fat women. None of, <clears throat> it was then, oh, it, is. it was then. <laughs> none of these groups, none of these groups proved stable. They all started to bicker. Members of the uh, overweight group, uh, bickered because there was a straight and a gay faction. Members of the black lesbian group could not get along. Some of them had white partners. They were called out for their privilege and they formed a separate group. And new identities emerged. A group of women with allergies formed and they issued a set of demands told, telling us not to wear dry clean clothing or hairspray. And it was a victimology. It was a victimology spinning out of control. It was a victimology <laughs> devouring itself. Now, I did end up, I was there, I ended up bonding with a group of radical lesbian separatists. I don't have that identity, but they all smoked. And by the end of the conference, I needed a cigarette. <laughs> that was 1992. These eccentric women and other like-minded colleagues would spend the next 25 years using their classroom to help students see the world the way they did. At the same time, they were writing articles, books, attending conferences, task force, working groups, just a tsunami of activism. And they developed, they developed a set of advocacy statistics, victim statistics to, to uh, complement their oppression theories. One in four women will be raped, two in three battered, cheated out of 25% of their salaries, and that's only if they're not already dead from, from a, an eating disorder in vain efforts to meet patriarchal standards of beauty. All of these claims, all of these claims are reckless exaggerations. <laughs> and they have been repeated so often they are now, in some places, beyond the reach of rational analysis. Now, let me, now, this is an important part of my story. None of this would have mattered had normal academic controls been in place. Academia, academia is full of enthusiasts with odd ideas. But if they go in for conspiracy theories and, and, and baseless statistics, they're going to get pushback from colleagues. We have a system of quality control. It's called criticism and peer review. That system has broken down when it comes to gender studies. Those women in Austin, their beliefs, their methods, their overall weirdness, they were easily as off-centered as, say, Scientology. 
But a group of Scientologists would not get very far in the modern academy. The academy is well protected from that. But because these women were marching under the wholesome banner of feminism, and because opposing them would seem like you were being anti-woman, they faced little opposition. Many scholars just ran for cover. So their influence has grown. And now look what we have. What we have, and I'm going to end here. I'm going, today, gender scholars, along with risk-averse campus administrators and uh, mischievous, uh, credulous students, have formed an axis of intolerance. Now, so, sir, I happen. <clears throat> you're justifying your ageism. I happen to be a cisgendered lady of a certain age with serious rotator cuff issues, okay? So, <laughs> today's millennials, you're going to have to decide, is yours going to be the generation that stands by as your basic freedoms are stripped away, where you, where you can't go and hear a speaker? I, my best guess is that the millennials, are, like every generation before them, they are going to rally, they're going to defend their liberties, and I already see signs of resistance. I just hope it's not too late. Thank you. The BMP. Oh, that was a clever one. The, um, what happened, of course, as anyone with any, with any brains would be able to predict, was that the BNP evaporated. When British people saw what the, the guy who ran this party was really like, they stopped voting for that party. A couple of years later, the BNP is no longer a force in British politics. This is why it isn't just important to give platforms to ordinary speech, it's important to give platforms to all speech. Because sunlight is the best disinfectant, and the best way to deal... Absolutely. The best, way, the best way to deal with people that you don't agree with, whether they are conservatives or progressives, is the full glare of the spotlight, because you should have the confidence in your own opinions, and you should have the, for, the, the, um, the fortitude and courage to believe that you can beat them in a fair, open marketplace of ideas. And you, if you believe those things... Absolutely, absolutely right. If you believe those things, you have nothing to fear from any speaker. Yes. No, I, I completely agree. And I would say to those of you here who are screaming out and preventing us from finishing sentences, if we are such dangerous people, then let us speak. The more we speak, that should become apparent. My fear is that you believe the more we speak, the more, save your comments the the more reasonable and we will sound and people will realize that there has been censorship on this campus. There is no di intellectual diversity and an institution. <laughs> if an institution of higher learning, if an, uh, like this, a great university like this, if it changes its mission, if it changes its mission from intellectual inquiry to safety and making people feel comfortable, it, it will lose its reason for being. Since the time of Socrates, since, since the time of Socrates, Socrates, there was debate. And if you are a superior debater, ask a question. The, pay gap that we hear about that women are cheated out of, you know, uh, almost 25% of their salary. The highest earners are Asian men. They out earn white men by a margin larger than the gap between men and women. Check your facts and your privilege. <laughs> but I do, for those, for those who want to entertain thought and not simply slogans, which is not uh, in my mind. And, uh, the 23, the, the wage gap is simply you take all the men and all the women and you average. It doesn't take into account 
What did they study in college? What sort of job do they have? How many hours do they work, pay work? My sources are every competent economist who has ever evaluated the wage gap. Every one of them. But you, sir, if you really are interested in learning something, I suggest you listen on NPR. Two weeks ago, they have a show, Freakonomics. They entertained uh, a, a, a feminist economist from Harvard University. She was re re reporting on the latest data, and she said, we can't find a smoking gun. We look at men and women in the workplace, and most of it is explained by if it were really true that you could pay a man, you know, uh, a, a woman 23 cents less than you pay a man, what intelligent employer wouldn't fire all of his male employees and hire only women? Um, I, in, in various books, I have written about this. It used to be one in four, now it's one in five. Uh, there is a methodology you can use, and if you uh, define sexual assault, you enlarge the meeting to encompass, you know, you have a very vague definition, and you have a non-representative sample of people, you can get whatever result you want. And some, some of the sorts of women, the sorts of, the, the women that I met at this conference years ago, they already were talking about rape culture, and they wanted to document it, and they, we have they're fair, these clever people in, 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 in thrall to an ideology. They have spent years perfecting these methodologies. And when the Bureau of Justice Statistics uses meticulous standards, they set the gold standard for research, they do not find one in four. They find, they find a, a, it's too much. They find like one in 53 that, for sexual assault. That is too much, I agree. Please sit down. But it is worlds away from one in four or one in five. One in four or one in five would mean that this campus is as dangerous as the war-torn Congo, where they have rape camps. If you believe that, you are deluded. Women who are victimized by sexual violence, they need sound research. They need truth. They don't need hype. They don't need wild, hysterical exaggeration. <laughs> truth is on the side of compassion. Your best bet, as I said, it's going to be truth. It's going to be honest research. It's not going to be hysteria. What I see happening on the campus, just as in the past and still today in many places in the world, you have people policing uh, people for, he for homosexuality. On the campus, you have people policing heterosexuality, especially male heterosexuality. There's the same fantasy and projection, hysteria, effort to censure and to, to pathologize. It's not healthy. And I know a lot of you are, I, I feel very bad as a mother. I have two, two sons. I'm glad they got out of college before this happened. <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is so, it is, it is astonishing to me that Places like Swarthmore College, Wesleyan, that are the, probably the safest places on earth for women, these young women, Oberlin, they've convinced themselves that they are living in a rape culture. It is a trivialization of the idea of violence, the way that they're using it and calling Oberlin or, or UMass a rape culture. It's a misuse of language. And the best research we have suggests that there, there's it, to the extent, all violent crime has gone down, and including rape, but it's still a huge problem, and it's much more likely, many times more likely, to happen in, in the urban centers than it is on a campus. Oh, so the, oh, so the truth is down. racist. That's going to get you a long way in this world. <laughs> Panelists, if you're ready, we'll take the first question here. Uh, so I know this question might run foul of common courtesies, but um, you bring up the wage gap. I wonder, how much were each of you paid to uh, be here, if at all? I hope these guys weren't paid 23% more than me. I'll make a fuss. <laughs> Actually, I insisted on it. I refused, I refused to appear unless you were paid 77 cents on the dollar. You, I don't think Next you question. That. Hi, um, so I'm, I'm bracing for booze here, but I, I'm a Democrat. 
Um, I am the outgoing president of the UMass Democrats and uh, nationally involved with the College Democrats of America. Um, so I was just interested in what, um, I believe what Stephen mentioned, uh, that uh, Dr. Hoff Summers, you're uh, a lifelong uh, Democrat. So uh, my question is, um, as someone who strongly opposes a lot of the audience objections here tonight and uh, finds agreement with you on many points, do you feel as though Democrat, uh, the Democratic Party and um, what we're talking about here, a lot of it is c compatible? Thank you for being civil, by the way. The left, in my, in my experience, the left historically is very bad at ejecting its own, its own worst actors. I was a, a protester and a hippie leftist in the 60s, but that meant I was for free speech. We loved, comedians were welcome. I mean, we had the great, we had George Carlin, we had Lenny Bruce. They would not come near you people. The, 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 the ones that are screeching. Well, the comedians. comedians today won't go near you. Chris Rock won't go near you. Jerry Seinfeld won't go near you. Comedians who share your politics won't go near you. That should tell you something. But the comedians, when I, they were everyone that, that was for free speech, that, was, that seemed to me compassionate, that they were Democrats. And I still hope that's the case, but I worry that, that, that I don't think it's, I, I'm worried that the Democratic Party is going to have to absorb these uh, radicals that are coming out of the school, the colleges, that have been indoctrinated with very an illiberal philosophy, with no respect for due process, with no respect for the First Amendment, with no respect for all the traditions that are responsible for the greatness of this country, that make it the place where people all over the world dream of coming. We have this wonderful tradition we have to protect. It's not perfect. We make all sorts of mistakes, but it's a system that can correct itself, that can improve, and you have to understand understand it and I'm very worried about that spirit being kept alive and I think it's I, I just sorry to sorry Stephen but I, I, I hope that I can speak for both of us when I say that neither of us has any sympathy either with the religious right of the 90s who were the authoritarian um, instinct then Stephen may oh, have, neither, no, no, neither Stephen do I. may have different views on this no no I don't as a matter of fact um, I was so, sorry, sorry to cut you off we're gonna try to get through as many questions well, one as second we can. because that's important well good example you bring that up you know when it comes down to South Park I actually was there to hear um, Trey and Matt uh, Trey Stone and Matt Parker speaking and they talked about how Christians actually just didn't want South Park on at 8 o'clock at night it wasn't the same as when they did the episode of Muhammad where it had to get pulled listen you leftists often told Christians if you don't like it change the channel I agree Yet leftists got up this morning, came in here, and decided to be so self-important that they screwed everybody else in the audience who wanted to hear people speak. That's five steps further. Okay, moving on to our next question, if you'd like to step up here. Hey, so actually, I was going to ask about chalk as well, um, because we just recently oh, no. had an incident on this campus uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, where someone actually wrote Stop Islam on one of the buildings, like really, really big. They did like a detailed art piece for it. And so, um, you, Milo, you said, um, the best way to deal with people you don't agree with is to give them the full spotlight. And you, Christina, is, uh, you said, no intellectual diversity um, at an institution of higher education. And I'm sorry, you t spoke so fast I couldn't quote you. But um, so my question for you is that in light of you know, Trump coming out and talking against Islam, uh, is rates, again, rates of violence against Islam rising about 418% in this time period, higher than they were uh, after 9-11, which is amazing. They're higher than after 9-11. Um, we saw a lot of repercussions on this campus about a week ago, where some of my friends got beat up, where people got threatened uh, over the Stop Islam. And so I'm wondering where you guys think that opinions turn into hate speech and where that line should be drawn. Well, your, 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 your Muslim friends got beaten up because of chalk? Amazingly, one of my friends who's not even Muslim was defined as Muslim because he dressed a certain way and he's changed the way he yeah. dresses now. Well, listen, nobody would ever condone beating somebody up because they, they dress a certain way. By the way, sometimes when I say stuff, it's a joke, okay? We used to be able to make those. Um, listen, if people want to talk about stopping rape culture, in the time you just took to, to ask that question, there were probably a dozen women who were raped in the name of Islam in the Middle East right then. And there were tons of people killed. So listen, no one is condoning violence against Islam. I don't, obviously it's a silly litmus test as far as Donald Trump saying ban all Muslims. And it makes it hard for people like me who argue against the ideology of Islam. I think if you want to learn about the ideology of Islam, open the Quran, read five pages in any direction, and you will be... Yeah, we've had Muslims on my show many times. Guess what? I didn't like what they had to say. Well, that's your problem. Okay? No, it's not my problem. It's my opinion. 
I don't like it. On my I, I didn't I speak on your yes, behalf. You I talked about the Quran. Yes, are, Guess what? Not. I wasn't there for the you French Revolution. I can talk you. about it. Everybody you has a right. And let me, let me ask them. Being a Muslim back bad. The ideology of Islam has been bad for the me, last several me, decades, and it's not hate speech to say so. It's not racist. It's an ideology in a prescribed form of religion and law, and I don't like it. Like any other set of ideas, uh, Islam is a set of ideas, and like any other set of ideas, it uh, is, we are perfectly entitled to interro interrogate it and find it wanting. I personally find it wanting. I would also like to say, as a, as a, as a gay person, um, I am fucking terrified by mass Muslim immigration because the homophobia in the Islamic community, in the Ummah, is not restricted to terrorists. It is not restricted to ISIS. 51% of British Muslims believe that gay sex should be against the law. This is not Muslims in Syria. This is not Muslims in Raqqa. This is Muslims who live three streets away from me. Every other one of them believes that I, my lifestyle should be illegal. 39% of British Muslims believe that a woman should always obey her husband. Where the fuck are feminists on that? 25%... <laughs> Twenty-five percent of British Muslims believe that Sharia law should be instituted, which under certain circumstances treats a woman's... Milo, he's trying to narrow in on a question. Do well, we? I'm going to finish. Treats a woman's uh, testimony as worth half of a man's. The queers for Palestine, possibly the stupidest people to walk the face of the earth. Overlook the statistic that 97% of Palestinians believe that homosexuality is an unacceptable lifestyle choice. I'm not scared by terrorists. I'm scared by Islam. Moving on to our next question here. Uh, uh, when, does when does free speech become hate speech is the basic question, right? Yeah, that's a silly question. Hate speech is a figment of your imagination. If someone says something you don't like, you don't get to label it hate speech. Actually, Stephen, you do get to label it whatever the fuck you want. That's part of free speech. As long as you're not trying to make it illegal for someone to say something, you know, that's still free speech. It's free speech to call something hate speech. That's it. No, call to action is not allowed. If I say, hey, I'm going to punch you in the face, and I do it, that's not speech. That's an action. If someone says, gosh, it, it really, I really don't like your face, and it would be nice if it were punched, but I would never do it, is very different. People should be able to say what they want. If you don't like it, walk out, change the channel. All right, so I want to start off saying thank you for coming here and dealing with garbage like this, and just like, keep on stopping. All right, anyway. All right, so my question is, there's clearly... The, uh, a little bit part of the gender gap is because of the choices of the uh, majors that people go into. And I was wondering if you could choose one major to really tell people to steer away from so they can stop being this, uh, this really ridiculous stat. Which one would you suggest to get rid of at a university? Gender studies should be abolished in all publicly funded universities. I couldn't agree more with that statement. Gender study, students who go to study gender studies, particularly at federal funded universities, come out dumber than when they went in. They come out believing lies, they come out with their critical faculties impaired, not improved. They come out more fragile than they arrived. They come out less able to have stable relationships with people, less able to cope in the world of work, less able to be functional, well-rounded human beings. Gender studies departments are damaging young people, they should be shut down. Yes, absolutely agreed. Well, okay, yeah, uh, I would just suggest that uh, some of you uh, will think that uh, we're overstating our position, and I suggest you watch a video, a weekly video blog that I have called The Factual Feminist, and each week I try to, using the best sources I can, to tell the truth on gender issues, to correct myths, to correct hyperbole, and um, to suggest that this particular philosophy is, is not only, you're not going to, not only in terms of the wage gap, not only does it misunderstand the wage gap, the typical teachings of gender study, and not only are you likely never to close the gap if you study something like that, but it's also, as Milo said, it, I, I see this very bitter, divisive, paranoid philosophy. It's ideology pretending to be scholarship. It's propaganda pretending to be fact. And <clears throat> yes, history, and I and I urge some of the radicals in the room 
Uh, it, you're not always going to be radical. Some of you will change. Some of the best anti-Marxists were once Marxists, so I'm waiting for you to, you know, emerge. <laughs> we'll but take you in. Don't worry. We'll take you in. We'll take we're you friendly. In. We're nice. We won't yell at you. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, a lot of you want to be, you know, I, I see the passion and I see the earnestness and you're young, you want to change the world, you want to do it now and you, you're on the right side of justice and you think, that, but here's the thing, if you're on the right side of justice, history suggests you need a good grasp of reality. If you've got moral energy and you've got reality and, and truth, you will make pro progress. You'll be Martin Luther King, you'll be Gandhi, you'll be, you know, the, the women's rights movement, and they got the vote, and, and the, the second, but if you, history also shows us a different kind of activism, where you have moral fervor and misinformation, moral fervor, propaganda, that is conducive to fanaticism. That is con conducive to zealotry. And what I'm seeing on the campus and in this room tonight is the, is the zealotry, the fanaticism, the, 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 this eagerness to shut people down, this eagerness to silence, to censor. This, it, you've got to rethink it. If you want to, yeah. Okay, um, I was just wondering what you guys thought about um, the use of like harsh rhetoric, like racist, homophobe, stuff like that, and how that can lead to almost justifying violence against certain people of certain beliefs. Well, that absolutely happened this week at American University. Um, the same kind of dumb horse shit. Um, and on camera, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm the less, I'm the less uh, uh, conciliatory member of the panel, it is dumb horse shit, and you should be ashamed of yourselves. Um, but that, uh, for the first time, I think, at one of my talks, um, somebody who just was walking through the crowd um, here to see my talk was assaulted. And it was, I mean, it was a comedic spectacle, but it was also a crime. Uh, and it was an example of zealotry that you're talking about spilling over into physical violence. And I will tell you something, the, vi you know, the violence is coming not from the right, but from the left. And it is informed and justified in the minds of activists by this zealotry. Yep. And it has just started to tip over in my tour. And I have to tell these kids they are going to destroy their lives if they believe that the kind of yelling and screaming that sometimes tips over into physical altercations, which does not come from Trump supporters, does not come from libertarians, does not come from conservatives, comes exclusively and only on campuses from the left. If you think this stuff is justified, you are going to destroy the rest of your life on the basis of a, an ideology that is not rooted in fact. I urge you to reconsider. Hi, hi, I have a two part question. Uh, UMass, oh okay, okay, one part. Um, how, UMass GOP, you might be able to speak to this. Um, how long did it take to soak those chairs in the blood of Muslims and rape survivors? And how does it feel to be sitting on that bloody history? We, we don't, what was we the next question? To... Thank you. Yeah. If you want to talk, if you want to talk. Q&A is not an opportunity for grandstanding. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions I about what you've heard. I think the questioner's a little uh, confused. Next question. Next question. Hi, yeah, I wanted to ask um, if you guys were aware of the, the things you, that you said before about um, Islam, and I wonder if you guys are aware of how that contributes to acts of violence against Muslim people and Islamophobia, but you kind of already answered it, so let me just say, fuck Trump and Black Lives Matter. And, sir, I have a question. I have Change a question. My worldview. Are you concerned with the, gen the, the real rise of anti-Semitism on campus? And that it, at, at Columbia University, at Oberlin College, there are Jewish kids who are, at, I mean, there, there are threats now. It's an amazing loss safety. of perspective. You know, you have these advocacy statistics about the supposed explosion of Islamophobia, which, you know, basically always boils down to hijab pulling. Like, like people forgotten 9-11. I mean, are you, too, are you people too young to remember that, that you know, Buildings were brought down in New York, Belgium a couple of weeks ago, Paris a few months before that, and you're worried about a bit of hijab pulling? Get a fucking grip. Why do you feel, why do you feel compelled to defend an ideology that would throw you off a roof for looking like Rachel Maddow? It is 10, 11, 12 mainstream Muslim countries that would execute me for being gay. This is not terrorism, this is Islam, and I am entitled to, and I am entitled, 
I am entitled to dislike it. <laughs> 